Hello and welcome to Politics and Polls. I'm Julian Zelizer, a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University, and this is my co-host Sam. Sam Wong here, professor of neuroscience and molecular biology and founder of the Princeton Election Consortium. With all the fierce battles between the presidential nominees and the debates that we've been watching and the polarized atmosphere that everyone has been subject to, it's often easy to forget that the most basic part of the whole election uh, takes place within a matter of seconds, and it's actually voting. It's going into the ballot box. It's using manual machines, computer machines, voting early on absentee ballot, early ballots. Uh, the, the mechanism of the vote is at the heart of our democracy. And even though we think of this as a constant, the process of voting, the right to vote has changed dramatically uh, since the beginning of uh, this country, of this republic. And the struggle over uh, gaining access to this right and the struggle over figuring out how we will actually vote and uh, what that entails has been pretty fierce. Sometimes our democratic impulses clash with the right to vote rather than supporting it. So with such a historic election, uh, Sam and I are honored to have Michael Waldman with us today to discuss his new book, The Fight to Vote, which was published by Simon & Schuster. Uh, Michael is the president of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU's Law School, and he was the director of speech writing for President uh, Bill Clinton from 1995 to 1999, and he's the author of numerous books and articles, and we are delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. So maybe we can just start with the question of why has there been so much resistance in American history uh, toward what seems to be the, the most basic part of our democracy, voting. It's, it's history and it's current. And, and I got interested in looking at that very question over the long term because the organization I lead, the Brennan Center, we're in the middle of these fights right now. There's a whole lot going on all over the country where laws are being passed that we believe make it harder for people to vote. And to me, growing up, this had always seemed a settled issue. And yet here it was fiercely coming to play again, and I wanted to understand why is it happening now. And what it turns out to be the case is that we've had these fights from the very beginning. The idea of who could vote, how they could vote, and how that vote would be meaningful, not just the formal rules of who could cast a ballot, but really what would they be voting for, turns out to be something Americans have disagreed about from the very beginning, and it's often been at the center of politics not kind of a mechanical way that the public will is expressed, but a fight really over who gets to have a say in the democracy, going back from the start when we were anything but a democracy by any current measure. Can I ask just, it's a terrific history of this, and we don't have many histories of it. Why did you decide that a historical approach was the best way to get at this puzzle? Why did you want to go back in time? Part of it was the kind, uh, interestingly, the, the kind of work that, I do as a lawyer because courts increasingly, especially in the age of Antonin Scalia and the originalists, are looking at history to un try to understand the roots of various constitutional doctrines and provisions. And my last book right before this was about the Second Amendment, and that was a debate that was almost entirely about what the founders meant when they said a well-regulated militia. But the story of the vote, the history is less controlling as a constitutional matter and more as a matter of understanding what the values are that this fight is about. I, did, I didn't come away from this thinking that this was purely a clash of interests or classes, even though you had, at the, from the very beginning, new, peop, new Americans, new voters demanding their place at the table and other people fighting just as hard at every step of the way to stop them. But there was also over overarching all of this, from the beginning, this kind of civic religion, this idea that, as Thomas Jefferson wrote in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, that government is legitimate only when it rests on the consent of the governed. And the book opens with him sitting there at his desk writing that, you know, and it was, it was hypocritical, of course. He was at that point attended to by a 14-year-old slave boy, Bob Hemings, Sally's younger brother. But uh, I really think that that idea has a, has a long-term power as well that helped can help explain the expansion of democracy over time to what we hope it is now. And so was there at some point a turning point where it became realized that came a value that everyone who was female, white, black, other colors 
should be allowed to vote or perhaps that everyone ought to vote? Is, is there some feeling there that, that that shifted? At least as I came to understand it, that kind of happened early on. You know, as, as we all know, when the country began, only white men who owned property could vote. And that was a, a legacy. It was actually handed down almost as a tradition from England. And that was pretty much the rule in most of the colonies at the time of the revolution. But even at the very beginning, there was a far more radical, a far more egalitarian and democratic impulse. And one of, one of the only times when the American Revolution kind of looked like a real revolution, what we would think of peasants with pitchforks storming the palace, was in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia in 1776, where they overthrew the state government. And one of the major demands was an end to that property requirement. And Ben Franklin wrote that state's constitution. So uh, there was an awareness even then that there was a hypocrisy in limiting that just to white men or even white men with property. John Adams was up in Massachusetts, and he was writing the Constitution there. Each of the new colonies wrote their own constitutions because they were seen as separate, semi-independent nations. John Adams was urged, hey, you ought to do the same thing. You ought to get rid of that property requirement. And he said, then women will demand a right to vote. And lads of 18 will think their interests insufficiently attended to, and they will demand a right to vote. And men who hath not a farthing to their name will think themselves worthy of an equal voice in government. They will demand a right to vote. There will be no end of it. And that, that uh, self-propulsion of the idea, well, it, that's sort of the story. There was no end of it. Is there anyone who um, today thinks that maybe fewer people should vote. Is that an express? I mean, it put the way I just put it. Are there people who think that? You know, in these current modern fights, there's a lot of putative rationales for what the purpose of these laws are. And there, there's the alleged wave of voter fraud, which has been debunked as little more than an urban myth. There's all other kinds of things like that. But when you scrape it away, you find a lot of the same line of argument for restricting the suffrage, restricting who really can be trusted with the democracy from the very beginning until now. Even the modern conservative movement, these laws are at this moment the product of a real strategy by the conservative political movement. When that movement was beginning in the sort of national review era of the 1950s, they, uh, they, they, they went back and looked at the people who opposed ending the property requirement back in the early days. There was a key moment in 1980 in the creation of the modern Republican coalition in Texas, right after Ronald Reagan had taken the nomination. And he spoke to a big convention of ministers, of evangelical ministers. It's kind of a famous event. Uh, I even remember it at the time. He said to them, because of the tax laws, you can't endorse me, but I can endorse you. And this was a big wink at the time. That was a big, very startling to people. People remember that. They remember one of the other speakers announced that God in heaven would not hear the prayers of a Jew, and then Reagan had to spend a few days explaining that. <laughs> but the opening speaker was Paul Weirich, a name uh, that some people know. He said, you know, let's be honest. We don't want uh, – that. many of my brethren want everybody to be able to vote. We don't want everybody to be able to vote. In fact, the fewer people vote, the better we will do. Weirich founded the Heritage Foundation, and he founded ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council the lobbying group that lobbies for voter ID laws and other laws in the states. It's really central, turns out to be more of a central organizing principle than I might have expected in a large part of our modern debate politically. Can you, if we move back a little uh, on the same point, you have a really good section on uh, a key period is between Reconstruction and 1965 when the Voting Rights Act will pass, and you have in the South the backlash to the right to vote and the imposition of all kinds of laws and mechanisms to directly prevent African Americans from voting, like you talk about the white primary, Jim Crow laws. Can, can you talk about, a, so, so people have a sense of what you found, how did white Southerners go about preventing the vote and, and what exactly was the civil rights movement responding to by, by 1965? Well, you know, as you know, at the end of the Civil War, it was not by any means a given that African Americans, that black men would, would get the vote. Lincoln was opposed throughout his whole career to extending the vote to African Americans. He changed during the course of the war, seeing as, among other things, that by the end of the war, one in ten Union soldiers was a black man. When he gave his famous 
second inaugural, about half the audience were black men and women, many in uniform. He spoke from the second floor of the White House the day, a few days after the surrender at Appomattox. And it was really his first major explanation fully of what he wanted to do with Reconstruction. In the middle of this rather dense speech, he said, by the way, I've been criticized for not uh, supporting voting rights for uh, former slaves. I now agree. And he gave some conditions, but it was a real reversal. And he, at a cabinet meeting, he actually indicated that he may go further. At least one listener in that audience, historians tell us, caught the drift of what Lincoln was saying. John Wilkes Booth was there. And he gasped, that means citizenship. That will be the last speech he will ever give. And he tried to get the guy standing next to him to shoot Lincoln on the spot. <laughs> when, when he wouldn't do it, uh, he said, well, then, by God, I will put him through, and went to Ford's Theater two days later. So I, I don't want to pretend Booth was a big Lincoln buff before that. He ple- previously wanted to kidnap him. But the 15th Amendment followed where the Republicans, as a party matter, and a party politics has, has played a big, big role throughout American history on this. The Republicans pushed through extending the voting rights to black men. And there was a real flowering of democracy in the South, as we now understand. There were 90 percent voter participation rates among uh, black male voters in the South, lots of them elected to office. And it came to a rather uh, cynical end in 1876 with the deal that ended Reconstruction when the troops were pulled back in the South. One of the things that is interesting is the disenfranchisement, which we all know happened, did not happen overnight. There were still contested elections for a couple of decades. It only was in the 1890s when the Jim Crow constitutions were rammed through in the southern states that there was a, a basically a complete disenfranchisement of black voters. And that central fact, the solid South, the one-party white South, with very few people voting, and all of them Democrats, uh, was the central political fact, as you've written about, in American political life until my lifetime. I mean, until really quite recently. One of the things that was interesting is that something similar happened in the North. Not as bad, obviously, but the cities of the North were now filled with immigrants. Uh, Not from Mexico, but from Ireland and Russia and Italy. And uh, many of the same nativist backlash that we hear now was expressed then. Suddenly people thought maybe it wasn't such a good idea to have universal suffrage. John Adams' great-grandson said, if you have universal suffrage, you'll have the government of ignorance and vice by the Celtic proletariat in the north, the African proletariat in the south, and the Chinese proletariat in the west. So we better get rid of that. One of my favorite things is Walt Whitman came out against universal suffrage, as did The Nation magazine. So, you know, the kind of... The, the blue bloods of the time were really aghast about all this. And they put in place a bunch of laws that made it much harder for working people or non-English speakers or poor people to vote. So turnout was really depressed in the North and in the South. This is a big part of what the political scientists call the system of 1896 with that famous election with William Jennings Bryan against McKinley. Really, uh, we wound up with a system that threw up obstacles in front of participation that a lot of other democracies just didn't have. And they've, some of them seem utterly sensible to us. A good example is the secret ballot, the Australian ballot, as it's known, printed by the government, and you get to vote in secret. Well, what could be wrong with that? But it turns out, for starters, if you're not literate, uh, you have to be able to read it. And uh, things like that made it harder to mobilize voters and harder to encourage them to participate. So there were a whole host of ways. And it's a good reminder that in the late 19th century, American democracy really slid backwards. It's expanded over time, but not all in one direction. And that was a period where, by any measure, uh, things went backwards. There was also a new factor, which was campaign money, uh, which had not really been a big factor previously, but in the Gilded Age, with all the accumulation of wealth and concentration of wealth, suddenly big money became a, an even bigger factor, and you kind of had a demobilized politics with a much more a, a familiar feel to it to us now. At that same time, I've been reading about the electoral history of that period in the same time, I think, 1870s and 1880s. Congress was closely divided, so it seems like it was a pretty partisan time when there was a lot of division. And I'm wondering whether um, uh, that played into it, whether any of this was attempting to gain partisan dominance. 
Well, it's interesting. They, it was a closely divided time, although we look at it now and think, well, they were divided, but they didn't really have a lot of issues to divide them because it was sort of the spoil system era, the clientelist era. Uh-huh. And it was everybody was kind of in on the action. But uh, turnout was much higher until the 1890s. And part of what happened was a kind of suppression of the turnout from what had been a rather competitive system even after the 1800s. But one of the things that was interesting to me, because the, you know, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan group and we're nonprofit. A lot of the people who work in protecting voting rights and democracy generally are that way. And reformers always might tend to think, well, the party bosses are going to be the bad guys. But it has just been very striking going back to the very beginning, how much party politics and raw partisanship has been an engine of expanding democracy and to also get, fighting it, to get, fighting to restrict it. To get more people to vote for your side. Yeah, it's... it's uh, awesome. It, <laughs> <laughs> no, believe me, it turns out the political scientists were right all along about parties. <laughs> I mean, um, the very first voting rights breakthrough after the founding, uh, ironically enough, was when angry white working class men in the current context, they would be Trump voters, won the right to vote. They, they got rid of the property requirement. And that was not done by a citizen group marching and filing lawsuits. It was done by the new political party, the Democrats, the world's first mass political party in the era of Jacksonian democracy and Martin Van Buren. And, uh, and they, for self-interested reasons, as well as whatever other reasons, wanted to expand the ranks of voters, just like the Republicans did with black voters. And uh, you see this over time. Yeah, this was. I mean, this was part of the '65 Voting Rights Act. That's uh, there is a lot of discussion of Everett Dirksen, who's the Senate Minority Leader, as as being uh, able to work with Democrats and uh, being civic minded and into governance. But there was an incentive for Republicans to try to maintain or expand the African American vote. Right. It was, of course, competition. it was at a time, you know, in the, in the early 60s, the, the, the book The Deadlock of Democracy articulated a pretty common criticism of the American arrangement, which was there weren't two parties. There weren't two ideologically distinct parties. There were really the Northern Democrats and the Southern Democrats and the Rockefeller Republicans, as we would call them now, and the Midwestern isolationists. And it turns out that that actually created all kinds of competition for things like northern black votes. And we all now see the the downside of a, a party system that's a divided European-style left-right system trying to work in our Madisonian system of checks and balances and multiple veto points. One of the fascinating things for me, and y- your writing was tremendously illuminating on this and, and a lot of other people's too, of course, was uh, in, in looking at the way the Voting Rights Act was created. When I was working on this book, it was right after the the movie Selma. And so there'd been this kind of unexpected pop culture discussion of did the movie slight Lyndon Johnson um, in making him look like a bad guy until almost the last five minutes of the movie. I came out with the view that, yes, it did slight him in that it was this incredibly fascinating dance between these two Southern politicians, Johnson and Dr. Martin Luther King, circling each other trying to find advantage and eventually toward this similar common shared goal. And one of the, uh, as you know, Johnson taped his calls. And every, every, I don't know about you, but every time I listen to Nixon's tapes, he sounds worse. Every time I listen to Johnson's tapes, he sounds better. Although, of course, Johnson controlled which, which calls got taped. He pushed a button, so that might have had something to do with it. But some of the conversations with King about the Voting Rights Act were taped. And one of the ones that's fascinating to me, there's one where King is pushing Johnson. Johnson's kind of trying to dance away and say, look, I've got to try to pass the Great Society, which is for poor people and people of color, so I can't do voting rights right now. And then Johnson gets kind of worked up and starts giving a speech about the glories of the Voting Rights Act and voting rights. And he's trying to be a moral leader to King. King tries to show what a savvy Paul he is And he argues to Johnson, look, if you do this, it'll transform the black vote for the Democrats in the South. And we can build a new South with a new Democratic coalition. And, you know, he wants to show he's he's a tough guy on the inside. So it's It's a great conversation. It was it was uh, pragmatic king, pragmatic king trying to show he's not just a dreamer. 
Yeah, although numerically that didn't really work out too well because there are more whites than blacks in the South. And, uh, and that ended up having some pretty strong consequences uh, in the subsequent elections. And John, as, as we know, Johnson, at least uh, at many moments, saw that coming. Right. Um, the famous scene uh, where after he signed the Civil Rights Act, he, he said to Bill Moyers, his loyal aide, uh, you know, I think we just signed, uh, turned over the South to the Republicans for a long time. Well, looking at presidential voting from the 60s till now, that single act, the signing of the, uh, the Voting Rights Act uh, and the Civil Rights Act in the 60s, those led to a major shift in voting patterns. And so in the last 50 years, that's when you talk about polarization, that was at some level a moment of real purification for the parties in the sense that, mm -hmm. that it was time to, pick, uh, to choose up sides. You couldn't hide behind you know, being a Southern Democrat or a Northern Democrat because you know what? The Democratic Party got behind the voting, you know, voting rights and civil right. rights. And so that was a, a real kind of distillation of where we are now. I mean, you could argue that the northern, the pro-civil rights Democrats and Johnson knew, felt they had to blow apart the party to reconstruct it mm -hmm. along a, a more, which is what FDR tried to do in the late 30s unsuccessfully. It is true, and, and it's like a interesting. Racial, a purge of the, a regional purge of the party. A regional purge. Right. It is true that the, for, of course, for a long time you had southern Democrats who were racist and racially segregationist, but went along with the New Deal, not only because of the TVA and other benefits the South got, but it was just sort of the price they paid. And I think it probably did surprise Johnson and the other national Democrats just how fast and just how completely the white Southern Democrats would suddenly discover the party of Lincoln looked pretty good when it was right, the against the Civil Rights Act. The depth of emotion by, on the part of who were Southern Democrats then, right. and, it, uh, and they're it, not Democrats now. Right. And, you know, I don't know if this is your sense, but for a long time, and I've been, as was mentioned, I was involved in national politics for years before I went to the Brennan Center. It was considered a breach of decorum to point out that the big thing that happened was the white Southerners switched parties, you know, just went over civil rights. And that was considered not... Well, that was an accusation of, of bad motive and racism, and now I think it's pretty widely accepted. And this year it's laid bare. I mean, if you look at right. voting patterns from year to year, the correlation between 60 and 64 is close to zero, and now, uh, so there's a massive realignment, and now those changes get, are smaller and smaller. So if you look at voting patterns now compared with four years ago, Trump is, uh, Trump's support is a near replica of Mitt Romney's support. So there's, there's a way in which things have become very stable and I, I, it feels like there's, I, I don't know, like, as you say, it feels commonplace now to acknowledge that there's, there's a, a, a deep emotional and, and racial component there. Although the two things that have happened this year that are interesting that harken back to 1968 that, that make this year feel like a Rick Perlstein book um, it, it is that uh, one of the last remnants of the old party, mashed up party system, people forget uh, and I remember this from the Reagan era, it was not only that w what were called the, the old weevils, the Southern Democrats, voted for Reagan and his budgets, and then actually many of them, like Phil Graham, switched parties. But in those days, there were Northern moderates still uh, scattered all throughout the Northeast. And the question with them, they were called gypsy moths, and the question with them was whether they would vote for Reagan's budget. They don't exist anymore, but it took a long time so that when we talk about this election may be determined by suburban women in Philadelphia, those would have been Republican voters at any point in the previous, you know, century. Um, and similarly, uh, the, the working class white voters of Ohio or western Pennsylvania might have been George Wallace voters in an earlier time. And, you know, I think that Trump's populism on trade, if nothing else, gives those voters permission, in a sense, to vote their racial motives. Mm. Let me turn uh, to a different part. So part of your book is about the fight over the right to vote. Part of your book is over uh, the fight of how you vote. And the other part, which you mentioned earlier, is in some ways the meaning, how meaningful is a vote, what's the value of a vote. And I know this is an area uh, that Sam has a lot of interest in as well. Uh, two of the issues you talk about are money and politics and especially the post-Citizen United period. And the second is uh, another is the partisan gerrymandering. And uh, 
Uh, that's another set of issues that comes out in your book. Can you talk a little bit about whether um, the, the vote has less value, even though more people might have it? It's an interesting thing. These days, we tend to think of these issues as being separated and, and in silos. And sometimes people will say, well, why do you include that other than that you find it interesting? But for most of the country's history, going back emphatically to the founding, we've seen these issues as very interwoven. The formal question of who could vote didn't mean all that much if you couldn't vote for something that was important or, or for an election that could really reflect your, your voice and your views. And issues of wealth and issues of the power of wealth over the political system and issues of what we would call gerrymandering, um, and I guess they would call it that too, at least pretty quickly. <laughs> they had the word. They had the word. They had but though they were doing it even before they had the word, that turns out to have been self-evidently part of the same equation to the founders and to most people going forward. One of the interesting revelations was, you know, James Madison of note here in Princeton. Madison took this stuff very seriously. And when you look at the, his notes from the Constitutional Convention, they really did not debate very much about who could vote. One delegate pushed hard to have the property requirement written into it. Ben Franklin said, no, that's bad for democracy. Most of them just thought it would make it harder to get the thing ratified, and they just thought it was too complicated, and they kept it out. But they were very, and Madison was one of those. But he was passionate about his worries about manipulation of the rules in a way that looks very similar to the kind of stuff that's happening, I would argue, now. He was worried that, as he said, there will be no way to even catalog the potential for abuse by state legislatures writing rules to benefit their faction and disenfranchise their opponents. And he was talking about gerrymandering and he was talking about voting rules. And so they put into the Constitution the Elections Clause, which gives power to Congress to override state laws on voting. Well, if you look at um, election law, at least my reading of it coming as an outsider, I mean, I'm a numbers guy and so I'm new to election law, but if you look at uh, protections against gerrymandering, against weird districting, it feels like the last 50 years have been a, a succession, have seen a succession of more technical approaches, and, and I mean a broad range of things for technical. I mean like, you know, districts that have to be of same population, uh, one man, one vote requirements, what con constitutes a compact district, the Voting Rights Act. So it feels like there have been a lot of attempts over time to, to bound this through technical means. And by technical, I mean putting in place rules that limit that kind of abuse. So what, how many loopholes are left? It feels like partisan gerrymandering is a big loophole that's left over. Right. And, and the challenge is, so the, the way that the Voting Rights Act, after it was passed in 1965, pretty quickly it got rid of things like um, literacy tests. But what wound up being what was the subject of all the litigation for decades afterwards were these very technical, often very mathematical questions of dilution of the vote and opportunities to cast votes in certain ways. And, and it can be mind numbing. And as we look at a question like partisan gerrymandering now and what theories might possibly ever persuade the not always so spry uh, folks on the Supreme Court to do something about it, the idea that they will need to go through regression analyses and, right. and a lot of numbers to, to, to figure out what to do seems unlikely. Madison, they didn't have the, uh, the numerical answer. Um, well, they, were, they but, preceded the birth of statistics. I mean, statistics is a field that's 100 years old. Right. Well, but they, they, they had five fingers on each hand. And yeah, they, yes, <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> you know, and they knew how to gerrymander even, even, yeah. uh, even then. But their solution was a process solution. Um, it, was the, it, was, it was a version of checks and balances. So this elections clause is one of the only places in the whole Constitution where the federal government is explicitly authorized to reach into the states and override state law on anything. And that, that was a sort of a, a check and balance, and Madison fought very hard for that. It was, uh, it was one of the more controversial parts of the Constitution when it came out, and some of the early historians looking at the fights between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, they're kind of baffled why this, this seemingly unimportant clause could get people as worked up as it did. And some of the solutions now that might be more meaningful are process solutions too, such as having the nonpartisan commissions do the line drawing may be easier than trying to parse what precisely the numbers would be. It seems like with the prob these problems, though, now at least, partisan competition goes the wrong way. So with, I mean, you talk about the history of voting rights, there's been partisan competition 
driving the expansion because everyone wants more votes. But with money in politics and with gerrymandering and the creation of commissions, it seems at least from the day's perspective, the competition wouldn't be to reform the system. It would be just to continue with it or to make it worse. Is that true? Is that not true? Is there you any know, hope? That's on, my question. Well, so on gerrymandering, you know, again, this is something that's happened. We've had gerrymandering from the beginning, as the book describes, the very first congressional election, James Madison got gerrymandered by Patrick Henry in, in the 5th Congressional District in Virginia. This is something where the advance in uh, digital technology and statistics has not necessarily been good for democracy because it used to be an art and now it's a science. Parties now have programs and, uh, and all kinds of digital ways to kind of slice and dice and cut these districts really with a considerable amount of precision. There are some times when both parties are in it together. Kind of happenstance reasons, there's almost a cartel uh, where they both just want no competition and they're happy with what they've got and they just want to make sure there's no competition at all. In re the last two congressional cycles, that has not been the case. The Republicans happen to have, especially in the last cycle, the Republicans ran the table in 2010. It happened to be the case that it was an off-year election where turnout, as we now know, is so much smaller, it really benefits Republicans. And so the resulting legislatures and governorships really enabled the Republicans to, to gerrymander. It isn't the case, though, that it's always good for the Republicans or it's always good for the Democrats. So in California, it was Schwarzenegger and the Republicans who pushed for reform. In Florida, it was the Democrats. Um, in Ohio, recently, it was Kasich. Mm -hmm. And so it, that's something where there's party interest, but sometimes it can balance. It feels like though, that within the, in an age of polarization, when, uh, when issues get resolved so much by party and not so much by these regional interests, it does the situation does call for someone to step in and create a standard that redresses these. So for instance, a, a Supreme Court standard. Now you say that, that regression analyses are a little bit arcane. I, I think I actually kind of agree with you. But, but in the face of complex districting, it feels like it's time for some kind of standard that then the justices of the Supreme Court could lay down. I mean, just for example, I, I've calculated that right now after, as you say, Republicans running the table, the current advantage to Republicans is about mm, 10 to 15 seats in the House of Representatives. That's how many seats they've gained net as a consequence of partisan gerrymandering. It is certainly the case that that, that advantage could go in some other direction in the future, but that's a pretty big distortion of democratic processes. So it feels like uh, one could address at the state level, but it feels like a, there's room there for, for a nationwide standard. And, and interestingly, this is a moment where the courts may in fact step in and provide a standard like that, as, as you know, as we've talked about before. You know, the, one of the political parties play a major role, for good or ill. The courts in the long history of democracy turn out to play a relatively minor role, for good or ill, which, which would surprise a lot of people who think the Supreme Court is the repository of wisdom in all these areas. The Supreme Court articulated the, the one-person, one-vote doctrine in the 1960s, and that followed a period where the rural areas of states had just dominated politics in those states, and even as people moved into cities, they had very little political power. Now we have the partisan gerrymandering several decades later, and the Supreme Court has said for a long time they really don't like gerrymandering. They really don't like the system. They don't like the politicians doing this, but they don't know what to do about it. As Justice Scalia wrote a decade ago, there was no judicially manageable standard that they could figure out, well, we don't like it, but since there's going to be some partisan element in this at all, how do you know what's too much? Things got so bad that the Supreme Court in the last few years have given more than broad hints that they're ready to take another case. In his last opinion before he died, Justice Scalia said, okay, we're ready. Send us a case, yeah. And so that is one of the reasons that right now there are... Which, which case is that one? I don't remember the name of it, but it was a denial. Of, I, I, I may be getting this wrong, but I think it was like a denial of cert, uh, turning away a case or something. It was something not earth-shaking, and it was in the last week of yeah. the term, and it was one of these things where there's very dramatic constitutional rulings. Yeah, because it looks like there's that. at least four seats, uh, four votes on the court in favor of... Uh, some kind of def definition of um, a manageable standard. Right. And so you have cases moving forward now in Wisconsin and in Maryland and in North Carolina and maybe in Rhode Island, as I understand it, um, although that may not have 
happened yet. It's small. It's sort of hard to, but I could see it. Well, <laughs> you know, some of them are Democratic states and some of them are Republican okay. states. No, I'm just saying it's a small state, so harder to gerrymander. Harder to, and harder to come up with a standard. That, yeah. Well, the people aren't that. The people are the same size, but it is a small, <laughs> it is a small state. It's uh, one of the, nobody's really quite sure which of these theories will be the right one or which of these cases is going to be the one to get up to the Supreme Court. But it is a moment where it may be necessary for the court to kind of sandblast the political system with this because the par politicians aren't going to do it themselves. The money in politics issue winds up being more partisan right now than it has been in a long time. For a long time, it was, again, both parties, the incumbents of both parties could game the system, could work the system. When I worked in government, you mentioned that I was chief speechwriter for President Clinton. I was also his policy aide on campaign finance reform. I always joke that I, that's why I needed something else on my resume than right. that, you know. Uh -huh. um, and when he was elected in 1992, he identified campaign finance reform as one of his four priorities. This was at least in significant measure because Ross Perot, a third-party candidate that year, got 19 percent of the vote on that issue among a few others. And Clinton thought this was necessary to kind of co-opt that vote the same way Nixon co-opted the Wallace vote. And it was the liberal Democrats in Congress who killed campaign finance reform. In, in meetings that I attended with, with Clinton the day after he was sworn in, the House Democrats basically let him know, the liberal Democrats, that they weren't going to do this. And they felt it was their way of holding, clinging to their seats. In recent years, and especially since the Supreme Court has gotten involved with a series of increasingly, I would argue, radical decisions knocking down the whole edifice of campaign finance law, it's wound up seeming to benefit the Republicans a lot more. And so now you have the Democrats, whether they mean it or not, at their convention saying overturned Citizens United as a you know, big applause line, and the Republicans, led by Mitch McConnell, who really cares a lot about this, being on the other side. And, and it's, so it's much more of a partisan fight. And that actually doesn't bother me. I think to get to bipartisanship, sometimes you need to get to two, you need to start with one. Well, unfortunately, we can continue this conversation for a long time, but we are out of time. So uh, let me thank you, Michael Waldman. The book is called The Right to Vote, available on online stores, real stores, independent stores, virtual stores. Uh, go out and get a copy. It's really a phenomenal history. It's also, I think, an important uh, piece to read going into this election. Uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It means uh, a great deal to hear you say that. And that wraps up our episode. So uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll be back soon on Politics and Polls. Take care, everybody. You've been listening to Politics and Polls, a podcast series about the 2016 presidential election produced by WooCast. The content discussed in this podcast is intended to be informational only. It does not represent nor reflect the views of Princeton University or the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Thank you.